Welcome to the shooting show. This week, Jeff Garrod's on Fox Patrol, plus Byron reviews the Mauser M12. Uh, what's, what's happening now is I've got, uh, I've just found uh, a litter of cubs. Um, I think they've just moved in on me, a fair big, biggish size. And where, where they are, um, normally if they was on an open bit of ground um, or upside of a hedge where there's a bit of clear area, um, I'd take the rifle and just sit back. Um, but where we're going now, it's on the edge of a rape field and on the edge of a bit of game cover and a rifle probably wouldn't be the ideal gun, so I'm going to take the brown in and just stoke it up with some heavy cartridges and just see if I can sit there, squeak them out and try and see what we can do like that. It's better for the shotgun because, you know, I might have to jump up and, and take a quick shot, whereas it, it wouldn't happen with a rifle, so um, we'll get the brown in and we'll, we'll go and see what we can do. Dinner time, we just went up there, just put a little bit of netting up and put a little bit of... Um, Know, hide up just so I can sit behind and uh, hopefully give me a little bit better opportunity to uh, squeak them up a little bit, get them out, shoot them uh, when they appear or come into range. Right, what we've got here, this bit of maze here, it runs alongside the railway line, it goes to a point. I'm just going to walk down to the end of the, about halfway down the point, just get into this little sort of makeshift hide on the edge of the rape and just see what happens. Hopefully, you know, they'll be coming out. If not, we'll try and squeak them out, but we'll sit here and hopefully achieve our objective. We're in a familiar situation with Jeff behind the hide, but with Fox not pigeon on the agenda today, this shotgun mission has an entirely different feeling to it. Normally the air would be thick with grey crop raiders, but with no sign of a fox yet, the field is eerily quiet. Jeff has had enough of the silence and takes matters into his own hands. Any trouble with this, you know, we were sitting here next to this rape field, it's been so dry, they just get in here and they could be, you know. That's the thing about it, you know, because you, you, you've got to, you've got to go where you last see them and you just sit and try and wait it out, really. The only sort of good thing about it is, is, is that this rape, um, it's not going to be long before it gets cut, I'll probably give it another week week or so, so it um, gives me sort of like two or three options. Then obviously one, I'll come back here again. If we don't get nothing tonight, I'll come back here a couple of nights. Um, then when they cut the field, I can get a couple of mates, stand around it and hopefully shoot them as they come out. You know, they bolt out the rape. Um, and failing that, last option of uh, coming here with a lamp. And uh, I mean, when a field's first cut, you know, the first night out, you know, sometimes they get, they, they feel, lo they get lost. So, you know, it's a good time to pick them up. So, um, I've got, you know, two or three options to go on these, but it is important, that, you know, that I do control, you know, do get them because obviously, you know, they're gonna cause damage, which is, um, you know, as I was saying early on, you know, it's, it's not just feathers and partridge that they'll, uh, they'll catch as anything. So, you know, so catching and controlling these for the benefit of feathers and partridge, you know, everything else is going to have a chance to survive. So it is, it is important that they are kept under control. 
Jeff's not giving up yet. It's time for another round of calling. There's no sign of our quarry yet, but daytime foxing is always a hit and miss affair. And suddenly our luck takes a turn for the better. The fox darted back into the rate before Jeff could pull the trigger, but encouraged by the sighting, Jeff resumed squeaking with renewed vigour. With plenty of cover, some fast shooting could be required, but that's where the Browning Maxis and Ely Alpha Max cartridges should come into their own. All's quiet for a few more minutes, but Jeff stays alert, ready to make the most of any opportunity. Why that, boy that hole in the fence? Come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. See, the, see the gap in the hedge there? Yeah. All of a sudden I just see a head come up and go down again. Just kept on squeaking and next time I think I see it coming through the, just sneaking through the, the maze here. Yeah. Uh, but I think just as I pulled that, I think that obviously spotted it because that made a bit of a dart and just killed it the second shot just to the left of it. So, uh, well worth the wait just to get the one. But we know there's, I know there's another one here because it's um, early on we got, uh, I got surprised by one as it crossed over. It come out of the maze into the rape, just literally split second. All I see it just before it disappeared, no chance of a shot. So, um, but it's nice to have, you know, to get one. That's one fox cub dealt with, and a good demonstration of how to make foxing work with a shotgun. You know, you've got, you've got to obviously weigh out the situation with, with what gun to bring. I mean, you know, if, if you've got a clear shot at something like a grass, up the side of a grass meadow or on the edge of a field, you know, and you can see them coming out or you can see what you're after, you know, you've got plenty of time. Then obviously a rifle's the best thing, but something like this, you're only going to get a, a quick you know, glimpse at something, and you'd never have been able to get on that with a rifle, you know, and shoot it as it turned away. So, you know, the old Maxis was the um, best choice tonight. Jeff gives squeaking one more go, hopeful of catching a second fox while there's still time. But he'll just be the one today. Every little helps in the battle to protect the birds, and as Jeff packs up, he can be satisfied with a job well done. Jeff there proving that patience really is a virtue. And now, the shooting show news. This is the Shooting Show News. A packed FETAS Classic saw well over 300 shooters pack Westfield's shooting ground for four solid days. Hosted by Troy Foods and Clay Shooting Magazine, the sellout event has quickly re-established itself as one of the premier events in the FETAS calendar. Clay Shooting's Hugh Hopkins was on the ground to gauge the atmosphere and find out who's in the running for high gun. It's been nine years since Clay Shooting Magazine ran a FETAS competition. But with the support of Troy Foods, Zolly, Edgar Brothers, Promatic, and of course the Clay Shooting Company, it's back. The top two shooters from each day 
would return to Westfield Shooting Ground for a Zolly Super Shoot-Off and there was no absence of talent available. It's been very enjoyable and that's what it's all about. I don't think it's necessary to beat uh, shooters on distance, particularly to bring new people into the game. It's very important that uh, people hit targets and they must enjoy it, that's the main thing. I think it's one of the fairest shoots the way they've done it this year where you have to qualify on the day. As you can see it's quite windy today, so it makes the conditions a little tougher. So if you're chasing an outright score and they've had glorious conditions, you know, it puts you out of the ball game straight away. So to actually then qualify and go through to a final all on the same day, you've got a level playing field straight from the back. Ben went on to hit 136, which was enough to secure Sunday's second place slot behind Richard Folds, who hit 139. With Wes Stanton of Clay Shooting Magazine and David Kempley of Troy Foods both donating £5,000 each, plus the bolstered support of Edgar Brothers and Zolly, this shoot has sold out. I spoke to Derek Edgar of Edgar Brothers about the support he and Zolly were contributing before the Zolly Super Shoot Off. We've been looking at uh, various events uh, to, to sponsor. Uh, for, for Zolly and uh, with, the, with the introduction of the new gun, the new high rib, it was a, it's an important thing to, uh, to be seen to be um, sponsoring this particular discipline. It's a great setup. It's, uh, it's looks and like some really interesting targets. Lots of comments about the, the quality of the uh, clays and uh, yeah, I think, it's, I think it's a brilliant venue, yeah. A packed crowd watched John Lee hit 14 straight and Nick Hendrick score 17 before both shooters let subsequent targets drop. After 23 clays, Martin Myers had missed only two. Martin would go on to miss three more in his final seven, but he had done enough to withstand a strong finish by George Digby and won the Troy Foods Clay Shooting Classic Fitask with 25x30. Shoot off was ex extremely hard and everybody shot very well. It just happened to be that I come out on top at the end. Yeah, it's nice to shoot a fit I shoot with some prizes that are, are worth winning for James. The Game and Wildlife Conservation Trust has launched a petition calling for the publication of the Hen Harrier Joint Recovery Plan. Last year, more owners, gamekeepers and conservation groups worked together to produce a single plan to restore the Hen Harrier to England. But DEFRA has not published the plan despite possessing it for six months. The GWCT's Andrew Gilruth said the clock is ticking on hen harrier populations and that DEFRA should resist external pressure to meddle with the plan. Follow the link on screen to sign the petition yourself. Turkish shotgun brand Hooglu is back in the UK. The brand has been best known for its small bore shotguns, such as its 103 DE box lock, available in 28 bore and 410. But Edward King, director of new distributor ASI, said there were new models on the way. But that's the one that's been sold already in this country quite popularly. We're looking to expand that and add a new side-plated version to it and of course the semi-autos. We don't see it as a relaunch. Uh, it was, as you know, distributed in the UK previously. We've taken it on. We've actually expanded the range. We're making more bottles available. Um, and so in terms of relaunch as such, we just see it as a development of the range. There's good news for fans of big balls. There could be an international 50 calibre shooting competition in the UK soon. We caught up with the Great Britain 50 cal team at the CLA Game Fair. They told us how they got on at the recent World Championships in New Mexico and of their plans to bring the championships to the UK. The World Championships, we shot just over 300 rounds. Uh, Stuart and I shot in all five classes. The other shot is just shot 150 rounds over the past three days. It's quite arduous. We train at military ranges, military field firing ranges. The problem in the UK is we haven't got a gallery range system capable of using these, apart from a couple of small military ranges. We've only got three or four lanes, so you couldn't have a hundred shooters at a time. Um, when, when it comes off, it'll be the, Br the British Sniper Challenge, which will be, hopefully be March, April 2015, held in the UK. We're still working on the final details of that, but there'll be shooters from all around the world of that as well. And we'll show how it's done on our doorstep. The Commonwealth shooting events are underway at Barry Budden. Hundreds of shooters are competing for Commonwealth gold, and Brits are among some of the biggest medal hopes. Steve Scott, Jen McIntosh and Charlotte Kerwood are among the athletes who have previously won Commonwealth gold. But it won't be Team GB that takes home the medals. England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland and the Isle of Man have all sent individual teams. That was the Shooting Show News.
This week we're going to be taking a look at one of the greatly anticipated rifles of last year. It comes from a German manufacturer and quite possibly one of the world's most famous gun makers. They gave us the fixed claw extractor model 98 action which even to this very day is seen as the most reliable and strongest action ever designed. It sees great favour on every continent and in the plains of Africa after dangerous games most professional hunters see it as quite seriously the only option. Uh, last year we had a look at the Mauser MO3, a rifle which I greatly enjoyed using and today we're going to have a look at the Mauser M12. Most people will be aware that the M12 is a bit of a collaboration rifle with Mauser, Sauer and Blaser all sharing the same parent company. The 101 from Sauer and the M12 from Mauser were launched at pretty much the same time. They shared a lot of components and some of the design features but still maintained uh, the, the uniqueness that make Mauser and Sauer separate companies. And they did this to launch two rifles into the market at a much more affordable level. Whereas the Sauer 202 and uh, the Mauser M03 are rifles which are considerably more than £2,000 and out with the reach of a lot of hunters, the M12 and the 101 were designed to really make these two great brands available to more hunters. So what will be very interesting to see, given that I've already reviewed the 101, it was a rifle I enjoyed using and it shot tremendously well, is exactly how the M12 shapes up against it and how Mauser have managed to keep their own stamp so that you can see that this rifle definitely is a Mauser uh, and not the same rifle as the 101. And I can see from looking at it already that Mauser have managed to keep that uniqueness that make Mauser what they are. This is certainly a good looking rifle. Despite having a synthetic stock, it has this air of tradition about it. It's got a soft textured rubber finish, which a lot of rifles have these days, uh, but this is particularly nice. It, feel, it feels good in the hand. Where you would normally find checkering on a wooden stock, you've got this sort of raised texture. Very nice to grip. I've shot this rifle a lot already, and it's a very comfortable stock to use. This scope is mounted fractionally too high. I didn't quite have uh, the right size scope mounts for it. But if it had been mounted correctly, there certainly would be no issue with lining your um, eye up to the scope. The standard barrel profile is fairly substantial and you pay for that in terms of weight. But it's a very well balanced rifle, so you don't really notice it. And what it does mean is that the rifle really anchors itself down when you're shooting. It's a very easy rifle to shoot. And having this slightly more generous profile also means that when you're shooting slightly longer strings, you don't really notice any effect to the accuracy. Uh, certainly if you've got a really light profile barrel, like for example I have on my Kimber, uh, if you're putting long strings down, you soon start to lose that accuracy. And with the, the Mauser, I never really noticed anything. I was putting round after round downrange and it just continued to perform. In terms of how it's fitted to the receiver, it's a little unusual. What they do is they heat up the receiver, they slot the barrel in, allow the receiver to cool around the barrel chamber, and you get an incredibly strong uh, fixing. In order to make sure that the rifle is in the correct place, as you will see when I take the stock away from the metalwork, there's a small pin on the barrel and this locates into a little recess and that makes sure that the barrel is set at the correct depth and with the correct orientation. As you would expect with the Mauser, we've got a nice big open receiver which makes it very easy to load ammunition from the top, although we do have a magazine. The other thing I like about having this nice big wide open space uh, where the ammunition is loaded is that it also makes it uh, an absolute breeze to check that the rifle is clear. Just have a, a quick look down to make sure you can't see the head of a cartridge. The top of the receiver is drilled and tapped and this is one of the big cost savings uh, compared to the, the MO3. On the uh, Mauser MO3 you have to use Mauser's own mounting system. What Mauser have done with the M12 is that they're allowing you to choose your own mounting system. And just like on a Remington or a Hauer, where you buy mounts which fit the top of the receiver, exactly the same thing is true of the M12. We turn our attention to the bolt, and the action itself is nice. It's smooth, it's got a positive lockdown, 
it just operates and cycles the way you want a rifle to work. If we remove the bolt, which you do via this little button at the back of the receiver, you can see that we've got six locking lugs and these lock into the receiver. We've got twin ejectors and a small extractor claw here. And these really throw the cartridges out and you'll see that uh, once we do a bit of shooting. The back of the bolt, where the bolt shroud is, is one of the, the big differences between the 101 and the M12. Whereas the, the 101 has a, a slide safety which sits at the back, the Mauser M12 has a roll safety. It's basically a three position, uh, fully locked down when it's reared, you can't pull the trigger or lift the bolt. In its secondary position, you can lift the bolt and eject a cartridge without actually having the, um, the rifle loaded and of course fully forward and you're ready to fire. Like so many safeties, if you just push it forward, it's going to make a bit of noise. Certainly that last step it makes a fairly substantial click. If you're a little bit more cautious with it and you just use two fingers instead of a thumb, you can roll it over fairly quietly. At the back we've got a big cocking indicator which lets you know without any shadow of doubt that the rifle is now loaded and visually you know that's an, a nice point of safety as well. The last thing to mention about the bolt is of course the bolt knob. It sits down at a, a very nice angle, I, I like this deep sweep. Don't know if I'm a massive fan of the fact that it's got a synthetic bolt knob on it but what it does mean is that it's incredibly easy to pick up with your hand and for, for quick cycling it's pretty much perfect. I've been very impressed with the trigger on the M12 and likewise with the 101 which shares the same trigger unit. At a very crisp two and a half pounds it really is good and I can't think of any reason why anybody would want to do anything to this trigger at all because it's quite simply spot on. The magazine is identical to the 101. It is ejected in the same place. Got this little uh, recess button here. If you press it, it pops it out and it unveils the synthetic um, double stack magazine. Now, now I have come around to synthetic magazines in recent years and it's this exact magazine design that really changed my mind. I was always adamant that magazines and a rifle should be made from metal. However, constructed correctly as this magazine has been out of the right materials, very strong polymers. This magazine actually complements the rifle. It has functioned flawlessly and it, it does the job. That's pretty much all for the externals. So now I'm going to take the rifle to bits and we're going to see how it's put together. Overall, there's nothing too unusual. It's a round receiver, it makes it nice and easy to manufacture. You've got the little peg which I described earlier, which is the, the locator pin for the barrel. You've got your trigger unit, which is adjustable via this grub screw here. And then you've got your recoil lug, and this is a little bit odd. Basically what we have here is these two pins are fixed into the receiver, and this block, which is the, the recoil lug, is then clamped onto these pins via this nut here, which itself is actually threaded inside and the external bolts on the stock screw into this. And this recoil lug here is held in place just here in the stock. And if you look carefully, what you can see, Mauser have placed a shaped and reinforced a back plate for the recoil lug to butt against. They also have these two metal pins either side which ensure that the recoil lug is centered against this back plate. It's a slightly unusual design that I've only actually ever seen in the 101 apart from in the M12 and only time is really going to tell how well it works. So that only leaves us with the shooting to do. So I'm going to put it back together, I'm going to lie down, we're going to get it on target at 100 and then I'm going to shoot the steel plate that I've got out at 320 odd meters and really test the rifle and see what it can do for us.
Well, the rifle certainly shoots, there's no doubt about that. Once I had it on paper, first three shot group just here at the top, I mean, that's probably less than three quarters of an inch. I moved it down one click to give me one and a half inch high zero, two shots broke one another. I didn't correct the small error off to the right here, there's a fairly stiff breeze and I think that that was the reason for it. I then took two shots out of my 320 meter plate, put the shots right beside one another, no trouble whatsoever. So the rifle certainly shoots, there's no doubt about that and I'm sure I could do this all day long. In terms of choice, it's really going to be down to personal preference. Go in, have a look at the, the differences that you can visually see between the M12 and the, the Sauer 101 and all the other rifles that fit into that sort of price bracket. I think that the M12 is going to do very well. Um, at the game fairs throughout the year, go and check it out, get it in your hands, see how it feels, and I'm sure it's going to have a very popular uptake in the coming years. Well that's it for this week. Thanks for watching. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. This has been The Shooting Show.